Leviticus chapter 10. There's bad verses, you know, as opposed to the great ones. <laughs> I mentioned this morning, I think, we, we had three teens saved yesterday evening in, in youth group. And uh, actually, uh, two of the three were in Sunday school this morning. It's really exciting what the Lord's been doing with our youth. And I'll just tell you, if there's anything that gives me hope about the outlook, about the future, it's just that young people are getting saved. They love the Lord, and they're they're burdened and concerned about things. Teenagers were uh, grab hot dogs Wednesday night before the service. Probably be about 6:30 that we're serving up. Mr. Andrew and uh, Brother Charlie are going to be running the bus actually to pick up. And by the way, if the younger kids want to come, it's not teen activity that you're coming to, so they can come as well. So if you if you guys say go to Jamancy's neighborhood in Ash and the rest of them want to come, pick them up and bring them to church on Wednesday night. And I'd uh, love to have them. And so if your parents bring you, hot dogs are at 630. So, you know, make sure that you get here in time for an all beef hot dog. All right. Somebody in my Sunday school class this morning, one of the guys like, oh, I hate hot dogs. I said, they're all beef. He's like, oh, I love hot dogs. And I know exactly what he means, man. Some of that stuff that they call hot dogs, it was good for like teaching my cat to do tricks with, <laughs> but not good for human consumption. I swear to so, you know, raw hot dogs are great for teaching cats tricks. Seriously, teach a cat to roll over in just about a day or two if you use hot dogs. And uh, my uncle, he, he taught me that. He had a cat, and he'd go, Pow! and the cat would go, lay, lay on his back, his legs up, just look dead. And my mom taught our cat to play the piano. So she would sit on the piano bench and go, bong, 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 like this. So, you know, she'd start off with a, you know, a paw or two, and then, She'd look, yeah, you want that hot dog? You better go all in. So that's what I think of when I think of fake hot dogs. The ones that are made from fake meat, pink slime before they call it pink slime. That has nothing to do with anything. Are you in Leviticus chapter 10 yet? Yeah. All right, I'll turn there and we'll get started. Here we go. Verse 1 of chapter 10. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Look down in verse 6, And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and Ithamar his sons, Cover, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest you die, unless wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren... The whole house of Israel bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. So Father, I pray that this evening as we go to the Scripture and as we look at this passage which reminds us, reminded those in that day, that holiness is nothing to be trifled with. God, may we be reminded as well of ultimate judgment. And then may we see the opportunity to come near to You. God, the responsibility to stay near. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you read about Nadab and Abihu, pretty much uh, the, the Bible actually mentions these fellows quite a few times. I don't remember if it's six or ten or whatever times. But throughout most of the first five books of the Bible, and then in uh, the Pentateuch, and then later on in the Prophets, Nadab and Abihu are mentioned. And there's really nothing more about their lives that we know other than the fact that Nadab and Abihu were the firstborn of Aaron's sons. And so he had, of course, two more sons. Aaron had four sons. Um, and uh, his, his other two sons, Ithamar, Ele Eleazar and Ithamar, were his third and fourth son, but they would have been the first two sons. And Nadab and Abihu are mentioned in the genealogies. When you just numbering the children of Israel, they're mentioned in Numbers, they're mentioned in Exodus, uh, they're mentioned several times. Exodus, I believe, 24, for instance, they're mentioned. And anytime there are accountings of these are the descendants of Aaron, Eleazar, I mean, Nadab and Abihu are mentioned. But as far as what these fellows did, all we know about them is that they really messed up. They, 
they just, I mean, that's about all we know of their life is that they offered strange fire and God's fire consumed them. Why is it mentioned so often in the Scripture? Why is there such a mention of these men? Because honestly, the genealogies could have said something to the effect of Aaron begat uh, Eleazar and Aaron begat uh, Ithamar. You know, you could have just maybe mentioned them one time and then everything else would have been mentioned the descendants of them. Why are these guys mentioned so much? Well, I think that God wants us to have an impression from the lives of these guys. I always think about things in these terms. It would be kind of neat um, to be like a Bible photobomber. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, anybody here a photobomber? I'm a shameless photobomber. You are too, Josiah. Good. I am a shameless photobomber. My, my wife and I both are, actually. We will get in anybody's picture. We have no pictures of the two of us. If you come to our house, we only have a wedding picture up, do we, baby? We have, you know, a couple of, like, poorly rendered photos of us that were taken by somebody accidentally, and we're like, well, we better put a picture of us up. And there we have, we just don't, you know, we're not these people that go to see, like, we go a lot of places, but we're not these people that go to see a site. And, you know, when you get to the site, you know, this is the funniest one we were last year. Devin, you were with us, right? We were at uh, Lincoln Memorial. You remember Lincoln Memorial? Everybody was running up to the whole Gettysburg Address in the Lincoln Memorial. They would, like, literally rush, climb all the steps to get in the Lincoln Memorial, and they'd go up there, and then they would get a selfie of themselves with the Gettysburg Address, and then they're off. You know, I'm sitting there reading it, and then taking a picture of it. But, I mean, who wants to see, oh, here's me at the Gettysburg Address. Here's me at the Washington Monument. Here's me at whatever. I mean, who wants to see that? How many of y'all would like to see me at any of those places? Mrs. Price would. Yeah, Brother Matt, you would? Like, what is interesting about me I, I like at, at a land... You like my photo? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to... Oh, you'd probably like it if I put it on Facebook. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Because you're like, oh, he's at a cool place, right? Uh, because, But it'd be the place that makes it cool, not me. I just personally... I'm not self-conscious about this, but I know nobody really cares to look at me. Right? I mean, it's not like, oh, you know, let's just gaze at Pastor... Pro nobody wants to look at me. I almost said nobody wants to look at you either, but that wouldn't be nice. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to say, for, in my opinion, you know, people don't want to see me, right? Except my mom. There's always mom, you know, except for mom. But other than that, nobody cares to see me. So I just don't take my picture everywhere. But I do photobomb. If I can photobomb, I mean, I will photobomb anybody, anywhere. Uh, I'd be one of these guys that you see on the news, you know, such and such was murdered here. And you got this guy in the background going, hey! <laughs> you know, or CNN is fake news, you know, yeah. because the uh, InfoWars, I think, pays, what, $10,000 if you can get on CNN yelling CNN is fake news in the background. And so I'd be that guy, you know. Fake news! CNN's fake news! You know, so anyway, I'm a photo bomber. I would like to do that. I've never thought, man, it'd be cool to be a Bible character, but I'd like to be a Bible photo bomber. You know what I mean? Like, if I could in the scripture, you know, just get a mention. A uh, Bible photo bomber. There's a lot of photo bombers in the Bible, actually. Just a lot of people. And it's really just cool uh, to just study that person. Maybe they're just mentioned in, in whatever. Acts has some really great uh, photo bombers. Dr. Bill Rice preached, I think, one of the most helpful messages I've heard on just being what you are and, and being what God's called you to be from the guy, Arch, was it Archippus or what's the guy's name? That was with Luke and, and Paul and his team. Theophilus? No. Is it Archippus? Aristarchus. Aristarchus, thank you. Oh. Aristarchus. He preached a message on it. I mean, who, who preached the message on Aristarchus? But you go and you read about it, and it's like everywhere Paul and his team was, Aristarchus was there. And he's never mentioned. And, you know, he's never like Aristarchus went down and cast a hook into the sea and pulled out a fish and a gold coin was in his mouth. Or, you know, Aristarchus had a snake come out of the fire and bite him. And, you know, and, and uh, he prayed to God and he was healed. No, Paul was like the hero in Acts. You know, he's like the guy. But Aristarchus is a good photo bomber. Uh, Dr. Bill asked this question. He said, when, uh, if the news of the shipwreck, when Paul and these other men are shipwrecked, if the news had reached home and you were Aristarchus's parents, I hope it's Aristarchus. I hope I'm not saying this wrong name over and over. I think it is Aristarchus. 
it's either Archippus or Aristotle, one of those guys. Anyway, you were his parents, and they said, you know, Paul was in a shipwreck. What would you think? I wonder if Aristarchus is okay. Because see, Paul may have meant something to you, but your son would mean a lot to you. And his point was that everybody's somebody, and you don't have to be the guy that everybody thinks about or knows a lot about, but Aristarchus, when you see him, he's always just in this place serving the Lord. He's part of this important missionary team in the background, just serving God. And you look at a guy and he's maybe, you know, you think, well, who cares about Aristarchus? Well, God does. And that's the point. God, this is a great message. It was a, it was a help to me. I didn't preach it just now, so you say, well, it doesn't sound like much of a message. Well, it's because of, that's because of who just told about it, okay? There's nothing wrong with the message. Uh, but in my mind, Nadab and Abihu are Bible photo bombers. In other words, these are these guys that get in the picture. And you know, nothing is in the Scripture. Uh, are you okay, Jonathan? You got your arm stuck, buddy? Oh, okay. Get it out. It's going to come out wrong. I'm going to help him with his sleeve real quick. Here, buddy, let's fix that. Right there. You cold? No. Yeah. You can uh, move right behind Mr. Lee over there, and you'll be all right, okay? It's warmer back there. Freeze, stay there and freeze. Yeah. What would you like to do? Okay, freeze on. <laughs> okay. Um, so Nadab and Abihu, though, in my mind, and again, this is just my way of putting it. This is not being theologically accurate or anything. But in my mind, these guys are Bible photo bombers. They're in there. God doesn't do anything by accident. I believe in scriptural preservation. I believe that God preserves <coughs> the scripture. Everything in the God's word is what the Bible says, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So here's a count of these guys. And actually, Leviticus chapter 10, when we talk about Nadab and Abihu, is the most detailed account about Nadab and Abihu. And so in my mind, it's like, well, if, if you're going to find a nugget, if you're going to get something, where's it at? Well, it's going to be right here. And I found it. I found it. It's in verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, uh, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Your Aaron... Your sons, all four of them, are serving with you in the temple. According to the accounts, they have been anointed with special oil, and they're not to leave the temple until they finish carrying out the service or the work in the temple. And while they're working in the temple, one of their things was to offer from the, from the altar of the Lord fire. But fire couldn't come from just anywhere. It had to come from there. The fire had to be kept burning. And it was a special fire and it was sanctified. And if you were... Uh, if you were Nadab and Abihu, you actually knew that. You actually knew that in your censer, you weren't supposed to take fire from just anywhere and use it. But these guys obviously knew they weren't supposed to offer strange fire. Strange fire just means from anywhere else than the altar. They knew they weren't supposed to offer strange fire, and they did. And subsequently, or consequently, God killed them with fire. Now there's pictures here, aren't there? Fire is always a picture of judgment. It's always a picture of purification. Fire is a picture of judgment. Fire is a picture of purification. God judged them, and God purified the temple. In other words, God's altar needed to be pure, needed to be clean. Why? Well, first of all, because a sacrifice offered to God was supposed to be pure. Because why? Because of the picture of Jesus Christ. Okay, so, you getting it? There you go. Tearing that shirt up, man. <laughs> All right. It's just hard to watch him shove his arm out through his, uh, through the, like the, make a hole in his armpit and not be distracted by it. Like, if you guys aren't watching it, I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jonathan, we keep watching you, man. All right. You good? You gonna let it be? Yeah. All right, hold on there, but be done pretty quick. Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, Nate and Abihu knew about. They knew that a sacrifice had to be without blemish. Why? Because it reflected the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus. All every sacrifice that's offered, Jesus Christ is. Everything is a picture of Christ. It's a type of Christ. And so these guys just casually just got fire. I don't know where they got the fire from. You know, it could have been a lamp burning in the temple for light, or in the, uh, not the temple, but in the tabernacle. It could have, could have just been a lamp. 
could have, I don't know where they got the fire from, but they got fire, put in their censers, and they and they put it on the altar of the Lord, and God just made a sacrifice out of them. Or God just purified the temple. Burned them. Gone. That's frightening to me. I think of a photobomb or the flash of the photo, and they're gone, you know? I mean, it's literally like that, just burned up, gone. God purified the temple. And, and by way of Moses, God gave Aaron some really terse warnings about how to respond. Do you think Aaron loved his sons? I think they were close. They absolutely were. They were serving in the temple together. His sons were with him. You can tear that one too? Mm -hmm. Your mom's going to be mad. And you. You better calm yourself down. Uh, Aaron and his sons were close. And yet, God tells Moses to tell Abra or to tell Aaron, don't you tear your clothes? Make a job it. <laughs> I asked him to rip his clothes, but just not right now. <laughs> it was early, five minutes early. Okay. Uh, don't tear your clothes. Don't put on sackcloth and ashes. Don't go out of the temple. Don't quit doing your job. Okay, you're at work. You're at work, and your sons are killed. Two of your four sons are killed. My work day's over. Right? I mean, it's it's amazing, you know, when you when you deal with the loss of a loved one. So you you do function the day that you right when you lose them. Most people are functional. It's like, well, now I got to do this and this and this and this. You do what you have to do because you just are so stunned. You don't know what else to do. And you you but you become mechanical. You become automatic. And Aaron here is in the temple, and Moses said, "Don't you take their side." against God. Look at the Scripture. Look at, look at uh, verse uh, 6. Aaron said, Moses said unto Aaron unto Eliezer and unto Ithamar his son, Cover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest you die, unless wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Now there is an explanatory sentence there, isn't it? For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. They've been anointed for the service in the house of the Lord, and until that service was carried out, they weren't to do anything else. They weren't to touch anything else. They were set apart, they were sanctified for the service, for the task. And two of the individuals who are sanctified for the task acted as though they weren't sanctified and they brought in strange, unholy fire before God and God destroyed them. And those that were not destroyed were told, you finish your job. The reason is because you've been anointed for the task. You are the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And when I look at this passage of Scripture, I think it's probably the same for you. I just think, man, this is serious business. You ever gotten into something and you realized how serious it was? And you're like, I didn't want to get in. I, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. This is more serious business than I thought. <coughs> uh, men find it out in the ministry all the time, actually. A lot of men that go into the ministry and they don't take it as... They, they desire the office, quote, of a bishop but they don't take the qualifications of the preacher seriously or they don't take the uh, just the task itself seriously. I'll tell you what, it has dire consequences. It, you want to get destroyed, try and be something that God hasn't called you to or be qualified to do something uh, and not take it seriously. It's a serious matter and there are a lot of instances of that. Having God for your Father and Jesus for your Savior is actually a serious business. I hear testimonies of Christians all the time 
who say, you know, when I got saved, I knew I needed to be saved. I just had no idea what God was going to do with my life. You ever met somebody that says that? Like when I got saved, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I understood the gospel and I wanted to be saved, but I just had no idea. And what they're talking about is disruption. In other words, I mean, God just changed everything. Whenever I send a young person to uh, Reformers Unanimous, a lot of times, I, several times, I've taken someone to the airport or to a bus and helped them to go to RU in Rockford, Illinois. And they always tell me, you know, in a few weeks I'll be back and I'll be doing this and this and this and this. And they tell you what they're planning their lives around. Usually they're in a relationship. Usually they have a boyfriend or girlfriend and they're like, you know, they're saying goodbye to their sweetheart and they're like, you know, I'll be back and I'll be clean and we'll, we'll continue on. Everything's going to be great. And they say all these things, but the reality of it is is that I know when they get on that bus, if they make it through the program, they're probably never going to be in that relationship again. It's just, it's just going to, they have no idea. But if they, if they make it through the program, they're not going to get back with the person that they are doing drugs with. That was not okay with them, you know, endangering themselves, quote, but was happy to be with someone in that lifestyle. Not going to happen. If they get serious about being clean and about having victory, then they'll have to separate themselves or sanctify themselves from the people who are not. It's universally true. A lot of times that you see, I see couples. They're not married, but they're in a relationship, and both of them, you know, one of them will get saved, and the other one's not saved, and the person is telling me, you know, well, you know, I'm kind of hoping this relationship works out, and I just think it's not going to work out. It's not going to happen. You can't be unequally yoked. It just doesn't work. And all of these things that I've mentioned reflect the same principle, and that is that God is holy, my friend. And when you separate yourself unto the Lord, that you've drawn a line. There is a distinction that cannot be crossed. Listen, Christian, hear me now. A Christian can sin and still be saved, but a Christian is never going to be okay sinning. You're never going to be able to go back into the world and just, you know, immerse yourself enough that you'll get comfortable with it and God will leave you alone. You've been anointed. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And you're God's child. And it's a serious business being God's child. I want to say this evening, it's a serious business being God's child. Now, I recognize this evening that we are not part of the, under the law of the Levitical priesthood. We haven't agreed to the covenant terms that the Levites had agreed to with God. I recognize that the Levites had a specific calling that you and I don't have, but I also recognize that we are believer priests. And that God's Son is in the throne room of heaven making intercession for us but we are sanctified, we are set apart, we are holy as unto the Lord. And I want to remind you that there's a reason that God's Word tells us that these men offered strange fire and were burned up, consumed by God because of it. And that's because God's holy. There's a lot of strange fire nowadays. It always has been. It isn't new. There isn't a new corner on the market of wickedness. It's amazing to me sometimes when people talk about we're in the last days and things are waxing worse and worse and things have never been as wicked as and evil as they are right now. And I just think, man, you haven't read much. You haven't read... I want to just tell you something. America's not there yet. America has a more godless history than the point we've reached right now. I'll say in my lifetime, America is as godless as it's ever been. But have you ever read anything that had to do with writers or philosophers or even the news in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, our country was on the edge of total perversion and destruction in the late 1800s and 1900s. Were it not for God moving through mass revival and in many other instances where God just got our people's attention, we wouldn't be where we're at today. But God's holy. God's holy. And if God is 
blessed you, or God saved you, or God has anointed you with His Spirit, my friend, your standard of holiness has step, stepped up. I want to look at a complimentary passage of Scripture that I think you're perhaps familiar with in James in the New Testament. If you go to James and chapter 4, I think you might be able to guess the passage of Scripture uh, that we're going to. James chapter 4. James has just explained that the source of evil in us is us, our lust, our flesh. James chapter 4 debunks any myth that the devil makes you do anything. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have. You uh, fight war. Uh, or you can, desire to have cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not. Because you ask not, you ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Where do your problems come from? Where do your problems come from? They come from your flesh. Most people think their problems have an external source. They think, well, it's my parents. Or they think, well, it's my circumstances. It's my school teachers. It's my work. It's my background. It's this or that. But the fact of the matter is your problems come from your flesh. And you have to own them and be honest about it. That's what James is saying. And then he goes on further to, to say in verse 5, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? You could reference the Psalms for all of those Scriptures. The Psalms of Proverbs, Psalms 37, 1, 73, 3, 23, 17, 24, 1 of Proverbs, um, Proverbs 24, 19, and so forth. In verse 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, this is Proverbs, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And then verse 7 and 8 are where we want to be. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That is not the end of that verse. That's the part I normally quote. But that's not the end of the verse. This is a verse that I believe describes a mirror relationship. It's like the kitty in the mirror. The kitten or the puppy, the first time they see the mirror. You know what a cat looks like the first time they see a mirror, right? They go toward the mirror and then they spring back because the cat and the mirror step toward them. And you know how skittish cats are. And then they kind of do the little swipe thing with their paw. And the cat and the mirror swipes back, you know. And then eventually they get up and they're touching it. And every time they touch the mirror, the mirror touches them. It's like, you know, and... Babies are the same way, but I don't let babies play with mirrors as much as cats. So, uh, the thing is, is that it's a mirror relationship. The Bible says, if I or if you draw nigh to God, it's going to be a way to have victory over the lust of our flesh. Our, our lust of our flesh, our flesh is what's causing us our problems. And if I draw nigh to God... The Bible says He'll draw nigh to me. Then the Bible says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. And we're reminded that you can't have two minds. The mind to serve the flesh and the mind to live for God. See, holiness excludes unholiness. In Christian, we're called to be holy. Because God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You say, Well, Pastor, I wish someone had warned me before I got saved. Somebody warned you, that's why you did get saved. But it's a serious business, actually, being a follower of Jesus. It's actually a serious business. And there are serious consequences for not following Jesus. And I believe that Nadab and Abihu reflect the consequences for not taking a relationship with God seriously. You say, well, it's an extreme example. Sure is. Got my attention. And that's Nadab and Abihu in the Bible. I believe God used those men to get our attention, to remind us that He's holy and that holy things are not to be trifled with. They're to be taken seriously. So, Father, please help us to remember and to practice being holy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.